Hello, kia ora koutou, yuma. Good afternoon or good morning for those in Western Australia and welcome. I'm Barbara Lemon, Executive Director for NASLA, National and State Libraries Australasia, and I'm joining you today from Canberra on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. On behalf of NASLA, I pay my respects to the traditional custodians and kaitiaki of the many lands on which all of us here today live and work. For those unfamiliar, uh, NASLA is a collaboration between 10 libraries, the National, State and Territory Libraries of Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand. Without doubt, I think one of the greatest achievements of this 50-year collaboration uh, has been designing, building and operating Australia's National E-Deposit Service, known to us all, of course, as NED, and NED is what today's session is all about. So what's on the menu? Well, we'll start with Joe Ritali as NED Program Manager for a brief NED 101 to get your head into this. Uh, we'll then hear two pre-recorded interviews from a national perspective. The first with the National Librarian for Scotland, Amina Shah, followed by our own Dr Murray-Louise Ayres as Director General of the National Library of Australia. And those interviews will be played back to back. Uh, for a publisher perspective, we'll then move to a presentation from Dr Stuart Glover at the Australian Publishers Association, where he is Policy and Government Relations Manager. Uh, to finish, we'll be rejoined by Joe Ritali and several members of the NED Steering Group for a panel session um, that's with Anna Ranick from State Library of Queensland, Leslie Sharp from State Library of South Australia, and Libby Cass from the National Library of Australia. So a very full webinar to be sure. Uh, my most important message at this time is please do make use of the Q&A uh, functionality at the bottom of your screen throughout the session, including to upvote other people's questions uh, so that we can easily find the most wanted questions in the short time available to the panel. Thanks very much to those who submitted questions beforehand. We will try and get to as many of those as possible. Um, keep an eye also, though, on the chat where uh, NASLA colleagues will be posting uh, useful links and information and so on there. Any unanswered questions, we'll take on notice and we'll do our best to um, put together a, a written response to go with the recording of this session, which will be sent to all those who registered and there are some 460 of you, which is fantastic. So without further ado, uh, I will hand over to my colleague, Joe Ritali. Thank you, Barb, uh, and hello to all of you who are joining the webinar. Um, it's great to have so many attendees interested in knowing more about legal deposit, electronic publishing, and how NED plays a critical role in collecting, preserving, and providing access to Australian electronic publications. I would like to start by acknowledging that I am meeting with you from the traditional lands of the Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also pay respect to the traditional owners of the lands on which each of you are living and working from today. Now, I usually start a presentation on NED with an overview of legal deposit and why legal deposit collections in the national, state and territory libraries are so important. However, I'm going to leave that to the National Librarians of Australia and Scotland, whose interviews we will be seeing shortly, and who both provide very compelling perspectives on the significance of legal deposit collecting. Instead, let's jump straight to talking about NED. Now, I'm going to share my screen. Opportunities and challenges of collecting electronic publications have been a priority discussion across the national, state and territory libraries in Australia and New Zealand for many years together with a widely shared view that a collaborative approach was the best way to address these. This gained momentum in 2016 when national legal deposit provisions in Australia were extended to include electronic publications through changes to the Copyright Act. The nine Australian member libraries of NSLA saw an opportunity to develop a single service for publishers to meet their legal deposit obligations and manage at scale the deposit, storage, preservation, discovery and delivery of published electronic material across Australia. 
Between 2016 and 2019, we grappled with the significant challenges of satisfying nine sets of technical requirements and legislation, balancing open access principles and copyright law with content security and protection of commercial viability, launching NED in May 2019. So how does depositing with NED work? This, here is the homepage of the NED website, and you can see that I have highlighted the statement, National e-Deposit is designed for publishers. But who is a publisher? Legal Deposit covers Australian publishers of all types, including commercial publishers, government publishers, schools, societies, organisations, clubs, churches, associations, and private individuals. Australian authors that are self-publishers including those using overseas-based online publishing platforms are subject to legal deposit. Self-publishers should check their publishing contracts carefully to understand how files can be uploaded to NED and what access conditions are selected. You can see a breakdown of publishers who have deposited by category. As of the 30th of June this year, we have just under 9,000 publishers. One trend we have seen is an increasing number of self-publishers. In 2019 and 2020, 480 self-publishers registered and deposited in NED each of those years. In 21 and 22, that number increased to 700 self-publishers registering and depositing each year. And in the first six months of this year, there are close to 400 self-publishers who have registered and deposited. Publishers can use the following methods to deposit their content and associated metadata to NED. Small numbers of publications can be easily deposited using the online portal. Publishers with a larger number of publications have the option of using an online bulk deposit process managed directly by member libraries, and it's good for up to a thousand items at a time. There's a bulk FTP deposit process, which is managed collaboratively with the National Library and is primarily for trade publishers making regular large-scale deposits. And finally, there's an email deposit option for community organisations who circulate newsletters via email lists, and this is arranged with the member library. Publishers using the NED portal may choose to register and registered publishers can view their deposit history, modify their details and adjust access conditions. Electronic publications deposited with NED need to be free of technological protection measures or digital rights management. This is mandated in the National Digital Legal Deposit Legislation and is required to enable the ongoing preservation of the publications. The NED service accepts new editions of ebooks for legal deposit, which are added to the collection alongside previous editions, as they frequently contain new content or extensive revisions. Reprints or updated versions of electronic materials containing corrections or other minor changes are not accepted, so we encourage depositors to make sure that they are confident that they have submitted the final version of the publication. The number of titles that have been deposited in NED since 2019 is just under 84,000. And here you can see a breakdown by publication type. So books, other types of monographs, such as reports and policy papers, maps, serials, and music scores. If we count the number of articles and serial issues in NED, we get to a number over 720,000. National, state and territory libraries understand the importance of protecting publishers' commercial interests and the intellectual property of creators. Public access to deposited content is provided consistent with the Copyright Act and legal deposit laws, and in accordance with the access conditions nominated by depositors through the deposit process. Access conditions cannot reduce or restrict rights under legislation. There are six access conditions ranging from least restrictive, which is openly on the internet, 
to most restrictive, which is on-site only at the National Library of Australia and the applicable member libraries. The NED collection can be discovered via member library catalogues and Trove, and delivery of content is via Trove. Library users are not able to download, transfer, save, print or copy publications that have an on-site only access condition. On-site only access allows users to view a publication via a secure viewer, which does not permit capturing or storing the publication in any way. Here you can see two titles, and I'm sorry that it is so small. I've circled the access condition statements. The first has the most restricted access condition, while the second title is available openly on the internet to view, but not download. Now, both these titles were deposited on the 23rd of August this year, and I took these screenshots of the records in Trove the following day, demonstrating just how quickly NED collection material is available. And here you can see a breakdown of publications by access condition. And what we see is that there's an approximate 50-50 split of openly accessible versus on-site only access. So what's next for NED? The collaborative approach that drove the development and implementation of NED has continued since going live with the service in 2019. Enhancements have been made to ensure that the service meets the evolving needs of publishers and member libraries. Towards the end of 2022, member libraries signed a new NED deed, marking a transition from the build and enhancement phases of NED to a mature service phase supported by a strategic plan and a strong governance model. There are two new roles created as part of this governance model dedicated to coordinating the implementation of the strategic plan. This includes my role as NED Program Manager and the NED Implementation Manager, the product owner for the NED software at the National Library. We are supported by the NED Steering Group, who are responsible for strategic direction and effective operation of the NED service, and the NED Operational Group, who are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of NED within each member library. There is also the NED Service Provider Team at the National Library, who are responsible for the viability of the NED software. A crucial element of the governance framework is the NED Strategic Plan. It outlines our vision for NED, our strategic goals and initiatives that will be realised through the delivery of projects staged over the three years of the strategic plan. We have a balance of priorities that address immediate operational needs of both member libraries and publishers, facilitate our collecting aspirations, strengthen relationships with all stakeholders and develop a policy framework that isn't just about what we're doing now, but what we need to do in the future. And we will be talking about the NED strategic plan in more detail in the panel session later in the webinar. That's enough from me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, we're now going to watch the interviews with Amina Shah from the National Library of Scotland and Marie Louise Ayres from the National Library of Australia. Thank you. Amina, thank you so much for joining us all in this uh, webinar. It's absolutely fantastic to have you with us. I'm going to jump straight into my questions for you. Sure. And my first question is, from your position as Chief Executive of the National Library of Scotland, can you tell me why legal deposit is important? Well, obviously, Abbey, our collections have been built on legal deposit collecting. And at the National Library of Scotland, that actually started with the Faculty of Advocates. And um, eventually, the faculty uh, decided that um, there were too many books and legal deposit was overwhelming for them. And there was a national movement to start a National Library of Scotland. So our collections are built on the collecting of the advocates outside of legal deposit, but hugely um, it, it's from legal deposit. And we can see from the past that that means that there is 
built in diversity and inclusion within our collections because that selection hasn't been made. We haven't been selective. It is everything that's published. And today that's proven very valuable in terms of us looking back and having a record of, of something that might not have seemed important at the time, but has really helped us understand uh, society and history and stories looking forward now. So for us, Legal Deposit is an essential part of us being a national library. To have that record um, into the future is, is so exciting. And physically, um, if you ever come, which I hope you do, um, and your colleagues um, in the other side of the world would come over to the National Library of Scotland, we organise our books by the date they come in rather than by any category. So when you go into our stacks, which is 13 floors of book stack beneath the, the entrance of George IV Bridge in Edinburgh, you can just stand at a date and see everything that's been published in that year, which is an incredible thing. And a colleague of mine uh, described it to me once as like putting um, barrels of whiskey down in a cellar. Um, and when you put them down, they're one thing. And when you take them out in a hundred years time, there's something completely different. There's a different meaning. And I really like that analogy. I think that's fantastic. First of all, I think we'd all love to come and visit you. Um, but it really did hit home when you said about that each year, you know, you can go along and see each year and what's been documented in those years. Mm -hmm. So we may have already looked at how you're capturing a diversity of voices and perspectives in your legal deposit collections. Can you give us a bit more information about that? Yeah, sure. So as I said, um, we often talk about the fact that legal deposit it has built in diversity because it's everything published rather than what we select. But on the other hand, there are gaps in that because publishing is evolving and changing and what people um, choose to self publish is, is often different and, and what we choose to prioritize to, to chase, if you like, those publications which might not necessarily automatically come to us that people don't think of. So quite often, more, most recently, we've been um, targeting 100 um, organisations which we feel represent diverse voices in Scotland that we haven't got the publications of. So these are small arts organisations, um, maybe um, environmental organisations, people who are publishing zines or their own small publications that might not necessarily, I'm sure it's the same for, for all of you as well, people um, know that Legal Deposit is there, but in the main, that big publishers know that. But of course, small publishers and people creating their own publications often don't. And they often don't really um, know that we are fascinated to have their organizational leaflet or their annual report and that they think, oh, surely you would just want to chuck that away. But in actual fact, that's really important for us. We did a lot of um, collecting, for example, around the Scottish referendum. Um, and now we've got leaflets and um, posters and flyers that relate to the referendum. Similarly, we did a project to, to and I'm sure many of you did, um, purposely collect COVID material and things that related to COVID. So these are stories that are perhaps outside of the mainstream publishing, where you have smaller pieces of information that in the future would be of interest to researchers and the public. That makes perfect sense. And going out to make sure you've got that diversity mm. of, of, of people within the legal deposit collections is, is I agree with you, so important. So in undertaking this work, how do the six legal deposit libraries of the UK and Ireland work together practically to support the collection and preservation of this legal deposit material? Well, yeah, we have a really interesting relationship in the UK and Ireland. And in fact, we're celebrating 
10 years of our um, non-print legal deposit collecting. Uh, so that collaborative effort started in 2013, and we'll be having a symposium in London in September to celebrate that. And I hope um, people from all across the world will attend and tune in. And I know in particular, it's really of interest to Australasian um, community because you do a similar sort of collaboration. So the collaboration that we have is between um, the British Library, National Library of Wales, National Library of Scotland, Cambridge, Oxford and Trinity College Dublin. And Trinity College is um, the national, the legal deposit collecting agency for the whole of the island of Ireland. And most recently, this has been really interesting from a political lens because of Brexit. So, of course, now uh, Ireland is actually outside of and, and Northern Ireland, and you know, it's all in a completely different sort of environment because of Brexit. Things have changed uh, completely, and um, so the law around that, and Irish copyright law, has has been interesting. So we're quite unique in that we cross political boundaries now, and as well as uh, geographical boundaries. Um, but the way that we do it is through our incredible staff. I mean, the relationships and the, the dedication and um, professionalism of the staff across all of these six um, areas. So we, we're crossing, of course, national libraries, uh, university libraries, we're crossing, as I said, geopolitical boundaries, but the staff come together as one um, and learn from each other, they share best practice, it's, it's really wonderful to see, I was so impressed when I joined the National Library in 2021 to see how those relationships have developed uh, so collaboratively and positively. But we also have an agency for legal deposit, and um, that is a separate entity from all of us. And the agency is actually based in Edinburgh, and all of um, the legal deposit librarians, the chief librarians of all the organisations involved, we are directors of the agency. Now, the agency has a small number of staff, it's uh, seven staff in Edinburgh, and they take receipt of all the physical published books. Um, that come in. So they come in directly to our warehouse in, in Edinburgh, and then they are uh, divvied up into all the six um, different libraries and, and sent off to them. So obviously, this was particular, this changed in, in Brexit because it's almost like you're sending something overseas now, and you know, there's all different sorts of, of rules around that. So that was interesting. Um, but we have um, a collecting framework where we decide each of us and collaboratively um, what will be collected and, and, and who collects what. So we have an agreement um, in the past that, for example, we would collect knitting patterns um, in the National Library of Scotland, um, National Library of Wales doesn't. Uh, so there are some things that we decide to collect collaboratively, but most recently we've been doing quite a lot of work to look at that specifically and consider what we might do more collaboratively and how we might work even closer and um, how we could build in efficiencies while still retaining um, that quality and making sure that we, we, we you know we have co enough copies that will be preserved into the future um it's fundamentally wonderful to see that collaboration now this is a slightly different subject but everyone's talking about it and it's AI. So mm -hmm. what I want to know from you is, can you share with me how you are using or looking to use AI in relation to your legal deposit collections? Well, it's fair to say that across all of our libraries, we've been experimenting in bits and pieces of projects with AI. So at the National Library, of Scotland, we've had a map transcription project, which is using AI, um, which is, has been really great. We've also had uh, the Transcribers project, looking at manuscripts and handwriting and being able to convert it into um, readable text so people can download that. So there have been pockets of, of innovation uh, in AI, but we haven't um, applied AI wholesale to anything within the legal deposit arena. Now, what's really interesting about that is that as we've as AI has become you know a hot topic, uh, there are more and more concerns about 
privacy, about um, the potential for data to be used negatively by third parties or, you know, for big players and um, big tech companies to take all of human knowledge and adjust it. Now, what we do know is because of the biases within our collections, the historic biases, if, um, if AI was to run through the collections, there's a very high chance it would repeat biases that exist within those collections. Uh, so that's something that we're really cautious of. We're also incredibly cautious of our responsibility um, to protect the rights of authors and publishers. Um, and consider how we create a framework, a policy um, framework that protects our collections. Um, but while we can simultaneously uh, use AI if it's beneficial, now where it could really be beneficial is in, for example, um, cataloging, making efficiencies in processing, um, maybe helping with discoverability in certain aspects. Um, so all of those things are things that, that collectively we're interested in and looking in, and we just feel very conscious of our huge responsibility, and I'm sure you'll appreciate this as well, that publishers deposit their books with us and their journals with us with the intention that we keep them safe for preservation purposes into the future, and there is an anxiety and awareness that that could be exploited and, and those um, the copyright of those works could be used by people for money and not for best intentions. And I think that the, all of those things are playing in our minds currently as we move forward, but we're certainly open to where we can use AI to create efficiency. Sure. It seems to be a really interesting time now for libraries. So looking forward, to the future, let's say to the next 10 years, um, what are your future aspirations for, for legal deposit? Well, I would really like um, government uh, users to really know what we do and understand it. We talk legal deposit, even as a term, is actually, it's a method of collecting. So we talk about it as you know we have these legal deposit collections but of course these are actually just become our collections um, and we, we in library world and certainly in the uk and ireland because of the volume that it is you know in, in the national library of scotland i think we get seven thousand items a week and it's re unrelenting you'll be the same you know it comes in all the time it needs to be catalogued needs to be dealt with whether it's digital or physical and um, often that can make us lose sight or we talk about it in terms of the process rather than the purpose. And I think that in order for us to secure funding into the future and use of it into the future so that people understand what an important role national libraries have in, in collecting this, we need to really make the case um, and advocate for it, talk about more about the why of what we're doing um, and why it's so important rather than focusing on the process. And that's one of the things actually about our profession, and you touched on it in my previous um, answer, um, about the fact that we can work collaboratively. And the thing that I am so proud of, you know, as being part of the library profession, is that we do work for the good and help each other and, and we, we learn from each other, we're open to sharing and we work collaboratively and that makes us very strong and able to, to face challenge. The library profession, of course, has been at the forefront of technological change since Gutenberg's uh, printing press. <laughs> so that, you know, I feel that we are well placed to um, rise to this challenge and to work together as a profession to come up with best practice and learn from each other. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to have you with us. Now I'm gonna jump into my first question and um, I really want to know from your position as Director General of the National Library of Australia, can you tell me why legal deposit is important? 
Look, I think it matters for so many uh, different reasons, and, and I'd like to kind of talk about a few of the more nuanced ones in a moment. The National Libraries are very different. Um, they can have uh, quite different uh, things that they work on, so we're not all alike, but the one thing that joins us together is actually legal deposit. So um, I think that really speaks to the, the, the fact that legal deposit is a core mechanism for recording as the national identity as it is um, as it unfolds. It's about reflecting the way that a nation is thinking and speaking to itself at any given moment in time. Um, I always stress with legal deposit that its comprehensiveness is what matters um, and that we are collecting everything that is being produced, not the things that we think are worthy or the things that might fit a, a kind of social or cultural agenda of the day, that we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible. I often find myself explaining this actually to people who you know, in the past they might have said things like, why are you collecting all those Mills and Burns books? Well, because they reflected what was being written and what was being read at the time, and, and in fact you can do a lot of work on these kinds of long running um, sort of semi serials. These days, I think that question is often asked around electronic publications and why we would be aiming to be comprehensively collecting rather than being really selective. I've even had people on our council, for example, say, well, surely if you're collecting social media, you know, you're streaming out all the crazy stuff. And of course, my response is crazy is part of who we are and we have to record that for future generations. So really, I think it's about this unfolding national identity. It is that it's really at its core. More recently, I guess I've been thinking of legal deposit as having another really important um, bedrock value. Um, many people in NASLA libraries will know that our public library cousins are having major issues with book challenges, um, with community members feeling that certain kinds of publications should not be available to the public. In this kind of scenario, our legal deposit collections where we really have got a firm rock to stand on that says we collect everything we can and we keep everything that we can and we will provide access to everything we can, it is feeling even more important than it was a couple of years ago. And the third thing I'd want to focus on is, is my long time in libraries. I've been in this one for 21 years. Um, and over that whole time at this library, I've been heavily involved in our fellowships and scholarships program. That's where we offer researchers the opportunity to come for between four weeks and three months just to delve into the collections for whatever they want it for. Over and over and over again, I have seen the value of parts of our collection that might have lain neglected, unused, maybe not thought to be very important, sometimes for decades, and then you get that researcher that comes together that with material and a kind of magic happens. I, I see this every year over and over and over again. We need to collect everything. You have to hang on to everything because in 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 years time, somebody is going to be asking themselves questions that use those collections. You've really helped us understand that. Thank you. Um, you've seen NED grow from its inception to launch and then to maturity. Um, and that's a very unique perspective to see it through that period of time. Can you share with us some of your insights from this journey? For example, what worked? What do you think could have been done differently? And maybe even what developments were unforeseen or surprised you? Over my career, I've seen that very often when you are working towards shared infrastructure in particular, the technical issues can all be resolved. It's actually about identity and business issues. So I think a good thing that we did was to take the time to get through all of those issues. If we just tried to ramroad it first, it wouldn't have worked at all. 
Um, in terms of what's surprising, the thing that has massively surprised me is the percentage of publishers who've been willing to make what they are depositing available for immediate public access via Trove um, straight away, either with no embargo or quite a small one. This really matters, I think, and I've actually made this point in copyright discussions, that if that's the case, then it's likely that a huge proportion of the physical material sitting in our collections now, of legal deposit material, that we have to go to a lot of trouble to try and clear rights on. <laughs> Actually, if people had been able to just tell us at the time what they wanted done with their material, we would, have, we would be in a position where we could open up far more of our collection for online public access. I didn't expect that level of, um, of publishers whose their primary purpose isn't to make money, it's actually to get their message out. I knew there'd be some, but that was quite surprising. Other things haven't surprised me. I'm not surprised at um, the rapid transition into using NED rather than physical means, although I think we have some issues there as well. Um, but I think that's a really, uh, a very pleasant surprise. And basically says people want to share what they know. I think that's um, wonderful to see the number of publishers who want to share their work openly um, through Trove. And that actually leads to my next question, because the National Library has recently done a consultation with publishers about legal deposit in Australia. So can you tell me a bit about the findings from this and, and where this might lead? Okay, well, I think the number one finding is really rapid growth in self-publishing. And that group is harder for us to get to. And both as the National Library and, of course, as the NED Collective, we're going to have to think about how we get our message out to um, the large number of people who can now easily self-publish because there are platforms that support this. So this is a very, very rapid growth over three years and something that we are going to have to come to grips with. So I think in terms of that issue of how comprehensive can we make the NED collection, uh, grappling with those self-publishers is going to take a lot of attention. The second thing that uh, is actually more worrying for me um, sorry, there's more good things. How easy it is to use and people trust us. That's great. I do have a concern though that along the way, I think we realised um, that one of the three original drivers for NED, which was to lower the cost for businesses to meet their legal obligations, has probably not been fulfilled. Um, there are two reasons for this that we have ascertained. One is that some NASLA libraries um, are still are actually requiring deposit of physical and digital. So immediately you're actually doubling up what a publisher has to do. The second reason is perhaps a li little less expected that in the old days of um, sending physical copies to libraries uh, like ours and around the country, you know, basically those publishers would have a single mailing distribution list where they were sending off the books to reviewers and off to bookshops that might stock them. And we were just on that list. So um, in other words, they've, they've actually probably had to introduce a new workflow to deposit electronically. So I think this is something we're going to have to come to grips with um, about whether we're actually increasing the cost of doing business um, for at least some publishers and collectively whether we decide that we need to take some action about that. So that was an unusual finding and not what we expected. I can see that. And, and so that may lead to reviewing some of those processes um, to, to, to accommodate the time that publishers are needing to take um, in depositing their material. Um, I'm really interested in this question and I'd love to hear your answer on it. Um, can you share with me how you're using or looking to use AI in relation to your legal deposit collections? Okay, well, the first thing I'd say is we are going slow. <laughs> we are playing it cool here. 
Um, I still think that with Australian publishers, and think particularly of this new group we need to go to, self-publishers, who don't yet have a reason to know that they can trust us, um, I think that we need to be extraordinarily careful about raising issues around, um, uh, particularly about using the text of those uh, of their publications for AI, machine learning, um, data mining. If I was a publisher, I'd be really thinking, like, what does this mean? Are they going to monetize it? Am I going to lose control? So I think there are very many things that we need to think through um, from an ethical perspective, from a business business perspective, and from a stakeholder perspective, perspective, before we even get to the point of applying the simplest technologies. So at the moment, we are not applying our optical character recognition to the, the net content um, that we do across newspapers. It will come, but this is an area where I think it is well worth hastening slowly. Um, so I think this is a really big issue for us, one, one that's very unlikely to be resolved within a two to three year time frame. So lots of potential, caution would be my, my motto here. And um, just before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share with our webinar audience? Yeah, look, I think what I'd really like to share is not to underestimate how unique this is. I spend a lot of my time talking about how unique the Australian library community as a whole is in terms of its commitment to working together. And, you know, that commitment has been in place since at least 1981 when the Australian Bibliographic Network started. So how unique the Australian library community is and how important it is to make sure that we've got this really long range, long lasting record of Australian identity as it's emerging, literally for those of you who are dealing with incoming med material, like minute by minute. So um, be proud of what you're doing. I think we should be really proud of it. I think it's very Aussie, it's really practical and it's like, let's get this thing done. And I think that we should make sure that we let people know how good we are at doing this. Thank you. And thanks to uh, NASLA's uh, Communications and Engagement Coordinator, Abby Beetson, uh, for running those interviews. And our sincere thanks again to Amina Shah and to Murray Louise Ayres for their generosity and time. Uh, many themes, I think, covered there, I can see coming up in the Q&A already. Uh, indeed, some questions hopefully answered there, uh, particularly in relation to AI. But keep your questions coming um, and we'll keep watching those for the panel. In the meantime, a very warm welcome to the man you can see on screen, Dr. Stuart Glover from the Australian Publishers Association uh, to offer a, a publisher perspective on legal deposit and NED. Thanks so much, Stuart. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks for the invitation to give a publishing industry perspective. I acknowledge country. I'm, I'm going to move pretty quickly because I've only got a little bit of time. We obviously see librarians as our core allies along with authors and booksellers. We have the same kind of commitment to the value of the book. And we work particularly closely with Alia, but also closely with the NLA and with and NASLA on, on a whole bunch of library issues. But I feel as though today it might be more useful for me to concentrate on where there are some differences of views be between publishers and librarians on legal deposit. So I want to do five things. I want to talk about place legal deposit in a kind of cultural policy context from publishers' point of view, talk about where publishers are at, some of the drivers for publishers at the moment, what we think of NED in a practical terms, what we see, uh, fourthly, the, what we see is the risks in relation to NED, and, and then some open-ended questions. So one way, the first one in terms of cultural policy context, uh, one way of thinking about legal deposit is, is as part of a, one of a group of pioneering cultural policy instruments which, which relate to the book and come into being from the 16th century onwards, but really gather speed in the 19th century with the emergence of the modern liberal state. So... We have copyright, which is obviously about creating a kind of market solution to old crown licensing models. We have literacy education, um, which was about transforming populations uh, to be you know, able and uh, uh, useful uh, workforces, I guess. We have uh, literary studies as a, as a kind of 19th century apparatus of moral supervision. And e even as literary 
studies declines in importance in universities, you can still see that the literary studies approaches to texts are kind of these highly moralizing accounts. We have public library collections, um, and then uh, and, and we have censorship and classification schemes. And they're very strangely, I think, in the Australian context, that they are a hot topic for librarians right now and, and for uh, publishers and booksellers. And we understand legal deposit really in, in relation to these other instruments, you know, this commitment to having a copy of everything. And we do see a, a kind of interesting shift from the kind of early paranoia about the printed book in the, in the 15th and 16th century, where there was a kind of in, a, uh, an interest in surveilling it and controlling it to this idea of preserving it and more recently to the idea of preserving it and providing access. So it, it is interesting the way that these these are real cultural policies. They're not just kind of um, what might be concerned, uh, thought of as just kind of minor elements of arts policy. They're tied to the rise of the of the liberal mo uh, the modern liberal state, and they're about creating particular kinds of civic populations, particular kind of kinds of workforces, and perhaps uh, forms of moral supervision in relation to those populations. And be because the book became first, many of these instruments. Um, uh, have lent lent great press and prestige to the book, you know, and the book still holds a great deal of prestige. So where our publishers are at in relation to all of this? So I'm talking about um, publishers are obviously a very diverse group. I'm talking about the mainly the group I represent, which are the 200 or so larger commercially orientated publishers rather than self-publishers. So we're not representing that long tail of up to 10,000 entities who might publish in any given year. So we have um, uh, members like scholarly and journal publishers, everything from the handful of global publishers who, who publish 75% of scholarly journals and down to the long tail of um, STM publishers. Um, and uh, those kind of publishers obviously already have a very particular kind of relationship to libraries, which is different, say, from trade publishers publishing commercial books. Um, and the interesting things there which feed into some of this discussion are really about the movement to open access and the fact that a lot of those, even the big publishers, have moved to what tends to be called gold open access in recent years. And the our interest in things like Kathy Foley, the, the, the national scientists, chief scientists idea of national uh, licensing schemes for, for paid access. So we've got a smaller bunch of major trade publishers. Um, uh, so some of these are global businesses and they all they at least have global business processes. A lot, a number of them also own book distributors. They among them these days, there tends to be a kind of full commitment to um Australian content. So say the largest of them, uh, pub, uh Ping and Random House, you know, publishes a lot of Australian content books. They, these are profit-making entities. But um, like all of trade, there's, there's been quite specific conditions in recent years. So there've been flat book prices, they're kind of um, downward in real terms and big increases in printing and freight costs. So while turnover, particularly during pandemic years have um, been good, the margins on individual titles have been very, uh, have been squeezed. And we've also been dealing with kind of shifts in format with eBooks and audio books, which uh, go to specific uh, legal deposit problems. But that, that those squeezed margins have kind of led to a, a lot of sensitivity about um, access to content and it's securing the, the the market. We've also got a kind of independent trade group, which are a, a couple of sort of Australian-based major publishers. Uh, a lot of these are, are more orientated towards, uh, say, uh, literary materials, very marginal profit profitability, sometimes operating in sub subsidised settings, such as university presses in the trade sector, sometimes with very specific cultural briefs, such as Magabala. And um, they have much less administrative capacity to meet the back end needs, the, including the kinds of demands that the NED schemes and legal deposit schemes make. Um, in terms of general things that are happening um, uh, uh, at, at well, sorry, I'll just I'll just one one other group I've left out, which is the educational publishers. Um, so uh, these are the schools, vet, and tertiary sector, uh, and they're an interesting sector at the moment, which sort of have been the most changed in terms of more uh, format format. So a lot of them are publishing on platform. Um, a lot of them are publishing because sort of eware materials. They have very strange. Uh, we have very strange relationships with our policy intermediaries, such as curriculum bodies. 
We're facing massive piracy problems in this sphere. We've had um, a large section of these markets eaten away by piracy. And one of the, uh, we've had uh, a number of publishers exit the market and a shrinking number of Australian content titles, which is a, a, big, a big issue. So the third issue I wanted to talk about were the kind of practical issues in terms of the administration of NED. Um, I'd say on the whole, uh, from the Publishers Association, we don't hear a lot of noise about um, the legal uh, deposit provisions. Um, but we do we do have a, a fairly regular content uh, uh, discussion about its implications in terms of access. On the whole, publishers seem to like the introduction of digital, digital deposit mechanisms. So NED is very welcome. Its conceptualization as a service for publishers is welcome. The actual interface and the support for its use has been very welcome. Where the we're less certain about shifts to compulsory um, digital deposit, but also, as mentioned earlier, there is this problem in situations where we still have to provide, members still have to provide physical copies. Cost is a concern, um, both in terms of uh, the cost of copies, but also in terms of administrative costs. And this probably falls a little bit unevenly across publishers. Um, the small, small publishers have very few staff and um, the admin load on, on a whole bunch of backend things such as metadata, um, lending rights uh, and legal deposit can, can be arduous. One thing we like is data. We think um, that it, it's clear that we're all becoming data-based or data-driven organizations and collaborating on that might be to our mutual benefit. So publishing metadata drives visibility and sales from our point of view. Data con controls distribution and book stocking in bookstores obviously cataloging information for legal deposit for public libraries, for educational libraries, information about collections um, and lending um, supports, collection management and the political case for resourcing. And we're all, I, I suspect, re wrestling with the special issues relating to First Nations data and metadata. So we uh, welcome collaboration um, with the library sector around that. And we've suggested to the Office of the Arts, the federal body, about an ongoing working group around shared data interests, including what might come out of the NED scheme. In terms of risks um, from publishers' point of view in relation to NED and, and legal deposit, it boils all boils down to access. So legal deposits had these joint goals of preservation and access, but what does access mean to librarians a quarter of the way through the 21st century? Obviously, books are there to be read and used, and publishers where you know we're the biggest supporters in the power of books. But there are concerns. So changes in uh, the level of access. Obviously, we like a scheme where levels of access can be managed, but any kind of um, uh, extension of access, uh, lack of consultation about extension of access through regional library networks beyond the state and. Um, uh, federal and the National Library is something we'd be very concerned about. Um, we're concerned about uh, un unauthorized duplication and distribution. So we like the current on-site on -site only um, access provisions that can be put in place. Um, we're concerned about uh, usage restrictions. So we obviously rely on copyright to control how works are used and to secure our market. So there is, you know, we we we'd be very careful about con uh, uh, conversations about education and research purpose uses that might dil dilute the value of copyright. We're concerned about ar archival modifications, including e-copying. Um, there's anxiety about li libraries creating uh, their own e-versions e of works. And um, I think the bottom line on all of that is that we'd, we'd encourage transparency and notification in terms of the development of um, in the development of, of policy. So uh, we're at this amazing moment, uh, as was mentioned by the two previous speak speakers in terms of AI, where generative AI is, has probably already committed the largest copyright breach in history to build its large language models. So publishers are very concerned about the control of massive electronic collections. We'd be very console, concerned about libraries being a party to any training of um, large language models or generative AI on the materials that they hold. And um, that came, that that kind of concern, and we like everyone else trust uh, our librarians, um, but there is concern about the mindset of some librarians, even sector leaders. And, and I think the New Zealand um, National Library's effort 
to um, to give its international collection to the Internet Archive, which is you know was already quite clearly one of the most prominent uh, copyright pirates, um, did a, a lot of local damage to the perceptions of the library, library sec sector. So just in terms of some future questions to finish, uh, to finish, I th I think one question on the on the table is have alternatives to the book made legal deposit and anachronism. Um, and we've heard that the, our national librarians respond to that. Um, but if we do need legal deposit to scheme uh, schemes, what schemes do we need? Do we need a scheme, particularly as we move to an electronic base? Uh, do we need it where there's a national library, states, several parliamentary libraries, and the Sydney Library all having um, legal deposit rights? Do we need to capture everything that we capture? Books aren't the, aren't the same um, single carrier of information that they were in the 19th century as lot, when a lot of these schemes came into being. Um, it's, books are now just one of many millions of cultural artefacts alongside movies, TVs, radio, and, and social media. Are there ways of culling before collection? Um, and uh, how can librarians, as well as thinking about the interests of users and thinking about the ongoing cultural purpose that they have, think of, uh, put legal deposit schemes to the benefits of creators and and publishers. So they're, they're the kinds of they're the kinds of questions that we'd like to ask. We do think there are two opportunities on the table um, to finish. One is. What does legal deposit look like in the current conversations about cultural policy making? In the last week, both New South Wales and uh, Western Australia have closed cultural policy exercises. Both of them ignore libraries. They ignore them as part of the creative industries and they ignore the links between the creative industries and the knowledge economy. We'd like to see a, a discussion about that as publishers who are a part of those same sectors. Um, and we're also interested to see Writers Australia as the new instrument within Creative Australia, the old Australia Council, having, um, including libraries and the national corpus that's represented by legal deposit as part of uh, a conversation. Finally, we'd welcome an ongoing conversation with librarians. We, um, we welcome the strategic planning process. We welcome the conversation that we've had today. And um, we'd We'd like to float the idea of the representation of publishers and authors on management processes for legal deposit, particularly as um, librarians wrestle with their own interests in the use of AI in relation to legal deposit uh, collections. But I might leave it, leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Stuart. It's a huge amount of provocation there and really, really helpful content. So uh, let's see what we can do with this in the last half an hour remaining. <clears throat> Excuse me if I could invite the panel to switch on uh, your cameras and microphones. Uh, I'm going to be welcoming Joe Ritali back as NED Program Manager, uh, previously uh, Director of Collections at State Library of Victoria. We have Leslie Sharp, who's Manager of Published Collections at the State Library of South Australia. Libby Cass as Director, Curatorial and Collection Research in the Collection Branch of the National Library of Australia. And Anna Raunick, who's Executive Director, Content and Client Services at the State Library of Queensland. Thank you all so much for joining me. I know we have a mere half hour. We have some excellent questions. We've just had a fantastic provocation from Stuart and a couple of brilliant presentations prior to that. So I hope your brains are as full as mine. Um, what I'm gonna do is just kick us off with um, some general questions that touch on the big picture, the strategy for Ned, and then let's narrow in on some of mm -hmm. these specific questions that are coming for us or at us <laughs> in the in the Q&A. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with you, Leslie, as chair of the NED Steering Group. Um, so Leslie, Libby, Anna and Joe are all long-serving, uh, I would say, I haven't said long-suffering, members of the NED Steering Group. Um, so we're really pleased to have you all here. And Leslie, you know, if we know that legal deposit as a principle dates back to sort of 1537, we've got King Francois I of France, who was uh, insisting on a, a copy of everything coming to his castle. And uh, many, many uh, years later, we've had legal deposit um, contained within our federal and state legislation for, for, for a long time. So national, state and territory libraries have been collecting. Um, why, in that case, do we need a strategic plan for legal deposit and NED? 
Thanks, Barb. Um, so while the legislative mandate does go back a very long way and provides the basis for the NED service, the strategic plan articulates the steering group's vision for the ongoing development of the service and the goals that will help that vision to be realised, um, particularly over the next three years. Um, we're currently in the first year of the strategic plan that's been developed. Mm -hmm. We want National E-Deposit to be innovative and valued and to be suitable for use by publishers and to preserve Australia's documentary heritage. Um, without a strategic plan, we wouldn't have the same focus and shared sense of direction as a steering group, and we wouldn't be able to measure the extent to which we've achieved the strategic initiatives and goals um, that help to deliver the vision. So it's a very important guiding document for the ongoing success of National E-Deposit, and it reflects the maturing um, of the service, as others have said, the moving out of the build and development phase and mm -hmm. into an ongoing way of operating uh, and taking a longer-term view. Right. So, uh, we want it to support all of those things. Thanks, Lizzie. That that's helpful. And perhaps we could um, dig a little bit into what those five strategic priorities are for those who haven't yet seen the plan. Uh, there are links in the chat if you haven't seen it yet and you've missed it. You can follow along. But Anna, would you mind talking us through the five strategic yeah. priorities and sort of who's working on this? Of course, and just to you know reaffirm Leslie's points. It was important to us as a steering group and I think NASLA members that we have a system that is sustainable and keeps growing. So, um, and that it also, as you'll see in the vision, that we not only want to be innovative, but we identify there in our vision that it's been valued not only by our users, but by publishers and the member libraries. So they're clearly identified in our vision that we, um, and why we have Ned is to preserve our nation's documentary heritage now and thinking about our users for the future, as both Amina and Mari Louise identified. Our strategic goals to build that national collection, to be recognised, trusted, and valued, to be respectful and accessible in how we make those collections accessible to be innovative, integrated and efficient. And it's been really interesting to hear those conversations around AI has so many different tentacles. And I think in the future, AI will be helping us to be innovative and efficient without necessarily touching on some of the areas that we all have concerns about. And more importantly, to be sustainable. So I noticed someone asked a question about how can we be sustainable if we're building this huge repository? Well, one way we're being very sustainable is by only building one repository. We're being efficient in for the publishers, only asking for one copy to be um, deposited, and we're being sustainable by only having one repository, a digital repository that all Australians can access. Excellent. I'm glad you touched on that because that's a question close to my heart. Jo, I'm going to throw one to you, which has been strongly upvoted, and it's about communications. It comes from Adam Moore, who's asking what's being done to increase awareness of the legal requirement to deposit publications into NED, and he has only just become aware of his own obligations as a self-publisher after hearing the Prime Minister talk about library loans for e-books. Could you tell us a bit about comms? Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. We recognise that, um, you know, we have a, a very large and diverse publishing sector and, um, you know, we've touched uh, a little bit about that in the various presentations and 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 an increasing group of, of self-publishers. Uh, and so we, yes, communications has really been identified as a priority as part of how we're going to deliver on our strategic goal of being kind of recognised, trusted and valued. Um, it goes to that recognition um, element. Uh, so one of the, um, one of our kind of projects that we're looking to start off um, uh, in the early next year, uh, early in 2024, is a marketing and communications plan. Uh, so that will kind of identify the various ways that we can reach the different publishing 
uh, you know, representatives that are contributing to MED. It's not a, a one size fits all approach. Um, you know, we have networks or uh, connections to the Australian Publishers Association, to the Small Press Network, and to the Australian Society of Authors. So we often kind of uh, circulate information through those channels, but there are probably many other ways that we could reach, um, you know, the the great group of publishers. And so we'll be uh, looking at, at what would be most effective. And then um, once we've kind of got that plan, putting that into implementation. Thanks, Jo. And I imagine the incredible um, diversity in distribution and variability in publishers across the country makes that uh, an enormous challenge. Libby, you might have something to add to that from the National Library's perspective after a recent consultation. Yeah, thanks, Barb. And yeah, my colleagues, um, it's, as Murray Louise alluded to in her presentation, the National Library's recently completed a phase one of a project. Um, and through that, we note that um, we're very we have very mature and robust uh, communication channels around legal deposit, um, but we need to tailor these to the ever sort of changing and evolving publishing landscape, particularly for the growth in self publishers. So. Um, we'll be doing some outreach this year, um, sort of hoping to publish, uh, tap into some of the self-publishing networks um, and things like writers' centres, editors', editors societies, um, as well as the opportunity to spread um, the message through influencers. Um, you know, book talk's a big thing, but perhaps encouraging those self-publishers who have more of a presence on social media to help spread the word, to reach out to those non-traditional Publishers. I would just also encourage anybody listening who's a publisher or creator to follow the National Library on social media and your own state library. Become a member of the ASA. Support the support the creative sort of um, sector, and that's a really great opportunity to um, um, you know learn and 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 help us um, grow the national collection. So there yeah, are lots of really exciting opportunities um, for the National Library and for Ned to really go out to where people, where the creators are, um, to talk to them and promote legal deposit. Thanks, Libby. Terrific. And I might I might stay with you for a moment, Libby. This is a, a little bit of a curly one, but a couple of related questions here from Amy Joseph and Colleen Simpson on uh, Amazon broadly, but let's say um, international publishing platforms and the challenges of, of uh, depositing a DRM-free copy of a work, Amy asks if publishers, particularly self-publishers, often struggle to provide a version of their publication uh, that both closely matches the published version and is DRM free. Um, I wonder if you've you've got comments on that. Uh, yes. So um, just let me try to refresh my notes. Uh, so <laughs> the National Library um, in the NED sort of ecosphere, um, we have carriage of overseas platforms. So, again, really keen to hear from people who um, can actually provide us with a contact detail of a person at Amazon. We're really keen to support um, people that use these international platforms to help them and the platforms um, add that value by helping and providing that deposit. So... Um, we've been working with a couple of self-publishing platforms, Ingram Spark. Um, they're an overseas platform um, to help sort of, I guess, provide that deposit to NED as part of the data flow. Um, and we, you know, so that that's one avenue. Um, but DRM free um, is a requirement um, for very good reasons. It's it, we can't preserve in the long term anything that's got technology. So it's it's also about acknowledging that. The DRM is around that preservation. It's not about um, making the content accessible. It really supports the long-term preservation. And we do understand it is a challenge for some um, people who use self-publishing platforms that put limits on it. And we're really keen to resolve that in the long term. It, it might take a little while, um, but we have had some contact with individuals, particularly who use Amazon, and really keen to, um, I guess, pursue that in the long term and um, and resolve that conundrum. Thanks so much, Livy. Have others in the group had that issue crop up through your own libraries or anything to add to that one? It's 
it's one of the more curly, perhaps, Leslie. Yeah, not too much in South Australia that I'm aware of at the moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, I might move then to a question on on data through NED, and perhaps I'll throw to Anna, but um, others feel free to jump in. I know that um, pulling data from NED is close to your heart, Anna. <laughs> and there's a question here about can publishers access usage statistics for their content? Um, uh, and Teresa's saying we're glad to share our content under open access conditions, but it would be brilliant to track how many people are actually accessing it via Trove. Um, Libby may want to add on that too. Question, because it's linked to the strategic plan and the operational plans. One of the activities that I'm working on with um, some of the NED steering group is a data project, and that is identifying the data that we collect the data that we need to collect and how do we make it accessible and to whom. So that ability to be able to provide data to publishers around the usage of their content is, it's quite interesting because we find, and I'm sure the other library members will say the same thing, a lot of the physical legal deposit titles aren't necessarily accessed as soon as they're published. A lot are accessed 20, 30, 40 years from now because that's when they're of um, particular interest. So it will be interesting to see and be able to supply that usage data to publishers and will they be excited to see usage or will they be disappointed not to have a lot of usage in the first year or two of the life of the product? But until we can show see that data and do some benchmarking and comparisons, we won't be able to tell, will we? Makes perfect sense. And Joe, you might have something to add if that's so closely tied to the operational plan. Yeah, I just uh, actually, I was really... Um thrilled to see that, um, you know, a question popped up about data and what um, publishers would like uh, to to understand about usage. I'm actually, um, as part of the sort of project that Anna mentioned, um, looking to uh, speak with uh, some publishers um, next week. I know it's very short notice. Um, just to understand a bit better what what they would like uh, to see and to understand. Um, so if anyone is interested in being involved in that conversation, I'm going to put my email address uh, in the chat. So feel free to email me after uh, after the session and I will make sure that you're invited. Thank you, Joe. Joe, while you've got your mic on there, um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about formats being collected by NED. So there have been a couple of questions and in the pre-webinar registration question lists as well, we had a couple on uh, AV particularly. Will NED collect AV materials in future? Perhaps it would be worth a recap of what NED collects now. Um, and, you know, I guess tying in with some of Stuart's comments about the rapidly changing, and it has been already rapidly changing for a long time, um, publishing environment where we're just seeing where we certainly are not just collecting books here. Yes, um, and it is it is something that the steering group talk about quite frequently as well. Uh, and so we are, you know, we, we obviously, you know, at the current moment, Ned is able to take, uh, you know, books and electronic books um, and other types of um, kind of monograph uh, formats. So if there are reports and policy papers, uh, serials um, and music scores and maps. Um, but we know that uh, many of our uh, legal deposit or member libraries in NED are able to collect other kinds of publications, including, you know, those that are produced uh, using audiovisual formats or other kinds of um, formats. So, uh, you know, one of our key projects that we are doing at the moment is to review our content policy, which is really what, uh, you know, dictate or, or defines kind of what we're collecting through NED. Uh, and we're looking at, um, you know, what are the future kind of collecting needs and formats that we need to be able to um, have publishers able to deposit through NED. Uh, we've been looking also at what are the emerging trends uh, in terms of electronic publishing. So, um, yes, we're aware of audiovisual, but what else is there um, that's maybe not um, as well known or is kind of just emerging? So we're looking at, at, at those emerging trends. 
And then we'll be, uh, as, a, as a kind of group, um, looking at which of those do we need to prioritise for development. So, um, you know, to, to be able to collect those uh, new formats or, or different formats through NED, we actually have to do uh, some, te some technical uh, development work. So um, uh, that would then be looking at, well, what's the, what's the priority for those different formats um, for that technical development work to commence? Uh, but we're absolutely aware that we need to expand um, what we're collecting if we want to be comprehensive um, and so uh, it's definitely a priority for us. Thanks Joe. And Anna? I think it's good to note too that particularly um, thinking about Stuart's comments and we're all aware that NED doesn't exist in a vacuum or a silo so the work that the National Library does with member libraries on web archiving collects a lot of the new and different ways people are now publishing or sharing information rather than a traditional book. And the fact that we deliver um, that content via Trove, it doesn't matter if the client knows whether it's a book or whether it was a blog post or whether it's something published on a website, they'll find the information. So the fact that we've got multiple tentacles trying to collect content regardless of the format is pretty important for us in terms of our future um, collecting. And there's a question there too about how that aligns with the um, collection policies of other collecting and cultural institutions like the NFSA. Um, Libby, I imagine this is this is an ongoing, ever-changing arrangement between cultural institutions. Uh, yes. So the National Library, um, through uh, some collaborative collecting with NCIs at the moment about the referendum, um, have been talking to the NFSA in particular around um, uh, social media and, and they are... Uh, um, have sort of, I guess, made clear that they see um, social media, sort of web uh, video-based content clearly in their collecting remit. So um, that's something that they'll be doing very selectively around the referendum. However, the National Library with partners um, are selectively collecting some social media where the technology allows us to do so, and all of that content really discoverable through the Australian Web Archive. It is a challenge. Um, with our infrastructure and with the sort of technical measures that some of the online platforms put up to prevent us from doing so, but we're certainly doing it. Um, and it just might not always be visible to people um, or, or accessible, um, but it's certainly um, content that we are conscious of and for, um, I guess for the National Library and under the sort of Commonwealth copyright, um, you know, the, uh, capturing the whole of domain, the, the Australia's web archive once or twice a year um, is something that we do. And we are picking up a lot of content um, that may be on, on um, the webs on um, .au domains, as well as that selective um, archiving um, of websites. Thanks, Libby. I think that would help to answer... Um... Lily's question there, which is about how Ned collects, um, if and how Ned collects um, social media. So I guess the answer is, it doesn't. But uh, that's happening elsewhere. Um, and does Ned extend to stories, videos, art, etc.? So um, hopefully that that question's been covered off by your collective responses so far. And Bob, sorry, can I just add a response to Jen's uh, question? Mm that some member libraries, some state libraries in their own legislation have the authority to collect formats. Uh, we certainly do in South Australia, can collect audiovisual formats, but not all member libraries might have that brief. Thanks, Leslie. And um, that's probably the, the differences between member libraries is a good segue to uh, a question that Libby is able to answer for Karen there about as a self-publisher, is it sufficient to lodge an ebook copy or am I still required to deposit a physical copy as well? For the NLA, for the National Library, you've met your obligations um, by depositing a copy of your book. However, um, you might have responsibilities um, to your state. Um, and there's information on our website. I think it is only New South Wales. If you're a New South Wales-based publisher, um, they also require a copy um, in print. And I guess, Karen, if your book has any reference to South Australia, um, you know, they might like a copy as well. Um, 
um, due to the, the quirks of yeah. their act. Well, for South Australia, if you've deposited electronically, your obligation is met. Thanks, Leslie. And Libby, uh, also to you, uh, mm -hmm. as a Kate Farnbach asks, as a staff member from a Commonwealth agency, mm -hmm. could you provide more guidance around what is considered a government publication? Yeah, very good question. Um, so um, I guess we consider anything published by a Commonwealth agency, a government publication, an annual report, a reconciliation action plan, a royal commission, um, and uh, deposit to NED is uh, preferred. So um, the, the Commonwealth publications, the Commonwealth Library Deposit and Free Issue Screen Scheme managed by the DTA sets the sort of parameters and, and it makes clear on their website um, that you can fulfil your um, obligations by depositing to NED. We're working very proactively with the DTA to try and refresh that wording to make it clear. There's a legacy issue with anything tabled in Parliament must be deposited in print to the National Library. So, um, again, we, we are working to try and streamline that. Um, but for the National Library, we do prefer uh, deposits to NED. I mean, Commonwealth websites are archived annually. However, not all government websites are designed to allow for the efficient publications that may be contained. So if your PDF is several layers down, we might not capture it. We also might not capture it within the 30 days. So the best way to ensure compliance and I guess to make sure that your agency's publications are preserved is to deposit them to NED. And we are also working with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and our colleagues up on the hill, as we like to call them, um, who are introducing an e-tabling system to see how that can be part of the NED ecosphere. Same as HarperCollins or a big publisher using a distribution system, long-term vision would be anything that's tabled to Parliament in digital form is ingested to NED with the appropriate metadata to sort of streamline that. But it's a long-term um, uh, vision, I guess, and, and work. Thanks, Libby. That's extremely helpful. And while you're in the hot seat, uh, this might be for Joe or yourself. Um, just because it's been strongly upvoted, we might not have a, an answer immediately. But this touches on the link between Trove and NED. Uh, and the question is about some issues in the handoff between NED and Trove, e.g. cover images not displaying in Trove despite being uploaded to NED. So the question is uh, just do, do we have insights into the problem or a timeline for a fix? So like answering that, I, mm. I feel like that might be a very um, specific Mm. Uh, situation or scenario um, because I I do obviously look at NED publications in Trove quite a lot uh, <laughs> during my work uh, and I see a lot of um, publications with you know cover images displaying and and you know the display of the actual publication working as it should so my suggestion would be that uh, we take that particular uh example offline and see if we can work out why it's not happening. There could be some technical issues under the hood um, that I probably um, am not able to yeah. <laughs> identify. And so right, <laughs> right now. Right um, now. But it shouldn't be happening um, if everything is being uploaded in the way uh, that it's set up to do. Um, so, yeah, so we need to investigate further. Thanks, Joe, and thanks for taking it. A number of people had um, upvoted that one so we can, yes, as you say, take that offline. Um, I'm looking through a couple of questions here. There's one uh, on whether Ned has any plans to retrospectively collect or make accessible digitised copies of out-of-print publications. I believe this bit's around. I'll quickly, I know we talked about this when we were doing the planning and Leslie will certainly remember that, but I will note that right now any content that we digitise from out of, out of print publications at the State Library of Queensland, we would make accessible through the catalogue and through Trove. So whether it's in a NED 
a repository or somewhere else. The important thing is that when you go to Trove, you'll find that digital version through the, the metadata that we provide. So um, that's my first comment. And secondly, I know we have talked about, particularly in serials where you've got serials were print and then a title's become digital and they're deposited in, in Tro in through net and available through Trove, how do we improve the user experience if we've got digitized versions of those? So that is something on our agenda and how that, whether it's done through a adding to NED or whether it's about better hyperlinking and making content accessible in different ways. But that's my thoughts. Excellent. Thanks, Anna. There's a, a quick one here from uh, Maureen, who's in a family history society and notes that some members write their family history stories and have copies done for immediate families. Are they legally required to deposit this with NED? Leslie, do you want to tackle that? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm saying no. <laughs> okay. Not, not legally a, required. Not legally required, not a publication um, made widely available um, for use by the public. Um, so out of scope. And Libby? Yes, I would say the same. Um, it's If it's just being produced for your immediate family, then it's not. However, um, you know, consider perhaps making it accessible more broadly because um, those small micro histories um, are a significant source of research and, um, you know, the copies that you might make available for your family might um, not be preserved into the future. But, you know, as if, assuming there's um, no issues amongst your family with a copy coming to NED, I, I don't see why, you know, we wouldn't like it or accept it, um, mm -hmm. but it just perhaps needs to be understood that, um, legal deposit is for things that are made available um, commercially or um, sort of freely available. So something that's produced as a private family history is not in scope, but there's, there is the potential for it to be brought into NED if, if you feel that that's appropriate. Thanks, Libby. Uh, that's clear. And I'll, I'll pull one more here from um, the Q&A before uh, perhaps um, asking you a, a couple of a sort of wrap-up questions as we head to time here. Um, we've got a question about uh, working for an organisation that covers multiple states. Does the annual report have to go to each state library or just to NED? I think that's just to NED. Is that right, Jo? Yeah, I was <laughs> just going to say that one's reasonably straightforward. I think um, if you have, uh, if you are working in across states, you're probably still, though, uh, physically located in one state. So that would be considered your kind of member library. Um, if you deposit via NED and you, um, you know, depending on the access conditions that you uh, provide, and hopefully you would consider at a minimum on-site access at all state libraries, that way then you would have covered all of your kind of legal deposit obligations. Thanks, Joe. And and while we've got you uh, a couple more quickies, uh, <laughs> Jennifer Curtin works for state government department. She's saying that we publish media releases, uh, fact sheets, and, and those sorts of things. Are uh, these documents also uh, relevant for deposit in NED, or are we looking more to um, you know full reports? Yeah. So it. it this is a bit of a, I guess, a, a, a grey, what I would call a grey area. Uh, and sometimes I think it's really beneficial to have a conversation with your member library um, to kind of understand, you know, what they may have collected uh, when it was print material um, and therefore they want to kind of uh, continue that representation in the sort of digital um, world as well. Uh, but... Um, we are, as I said before, we, we are doing a review of the content policy and we are looking at, um, I guess, what we're calling more ephemeral type um, material, which is often, you know, the things that are only sort of one or two pages and fact sheets and things that have got that sort of temporary transient uh, significance, um, you know, responding to a particular, uh, you know, situation um, you know, political, social, or whatever it is at the time, um, and determining kind of whether that material uh, comes through via NED and what what it would include. 
Um, but I think at, at this point in time, I, I would definitely uh, be in touch with my member library uh, and get some specific guidance on, on what they would like to, uh, you to deposit via Ned. Thanks, Joe. I think to bring us to a close, um, perhaps you could give us a few words on on how um, you've arrived at, at the priorities for, for Ned, let's say, in the next 12 months, and how do you feel like you'll know you've done it? So, um, that was really my kind of first uh, major activity in the role uh, was to speak to everyone who was connected to NED, so the member libraries, those who are working with the collections, those who are sort of um, managing or kind of setting strategic direction for collecting. Um, I spoke to uh, publishers um, and, you know, we, uh, we had also um, over several years uh, got quite a list of things that we wanted or would like to do um, as part of a sort of ongoing enhancement of the service. So basically we kind of brought all that thinking together. We, you know, we came up with, um, you know, a list of priorities. You know, we had over probably about 70 things on that wish list and we really had to kind of bring it down to what we could feasibly deliver in, um, in you know, the first year and, and what we need to kind of prioritise over the next couple of years. Um, but it was really based on, you know, consulting with those key stakeholders and understanding you know, what they needed operationally as a priority, but also what we need to do strategically to set ourselves up in the long term. Beautiful. Well, we'll be watching this space and doesn't half an hour go really quickly. Thanks so much, Joe, Anna, Libby and Leslie. And huge thanks again to Dr. Stuart Glover, uh, Dr. Murray Louise Ayers and Amina Shah and to all of you for so attentively um, being with us today and sharing your questions, as I say, we'll take those we couldn't get to offline and see what we can do with them. Uh, you'll receive a recording of the session and um, stay tuned. Thanks again, everybody. So long. <laughs>